Union Oil Company, on behalf of its 76 and Triton dealers, brings you Thrill. For all of us, life has its thrills. Thrills of courage, of music, of romance, of achievement. Life has a thousand thrills. David Brookman and the orchestra open the show with a timely arrangement of Easter Parade from the musical production As Thousands Cheer. January morning in 1881, Wyatt Earp, frontier marshal, risked his own life and the lives of his three brothers to uphold the law that an accused prisoner is entitled to a just and fair trial. Earp was United States Marshal at Tombstone, Arizona. His brothers, Morgan, Virgil, and James, were his deputies. In a land where the best argument was a six-gun, Wyatt Earp and his brothers were respected by all and feared by the lawless elements. Besides being peace officers... The Earps acted as shotgun messengers for Wells Fargo Express Company and attended to some of the company's business. On the morning in question, Virgil was absent from town. James was at the hotel eating breakfast, while Wyatt and Morgan were at the Wells Fargo office bidding goodbye to the driver of the westbound stage. Sure, sorry you ain't going along to ride shotgun this trip, Wyatt. Well, you ain't carrying any bullion, Bob. You won't need me. I know, but when road agents know Wyatt Earp's going along his shotgun, <laughs> they just naturally hold up. You sure got the living daylight scared out in Curly Bill and his gang. Since Wyatt wrapped a gun barrel around Curly's head over at the Oriental Saloon, that coyote's been pretty scarce around here. That's right, Morgan. But you can't beat no sense into that thieving maverick's head, even with a gun barrel. <laughs> well, guess I'll be getting along, boys. Uh, Good day, boy. So long. So long. So long. Well, I reckon I better get busy on that report to Wells Fargo. You're always writing reports, Wyatt. What's the good of them? 
Oh, I figured out this way, Morg. There's a lot of things happening in this new western country that nobody would ever know nothing about if it wasn't for the confidential reports of the marshals and the Wells Fargo agents. <laughs> Suppose you might say we're writing history. <laughs> Even at the moment that Wyatt Earp spoke, a chapter of frontier history was beginning a few miles away in the small town of Charleston. In a saloon poker game, which had lasted all night, sat Virgil Earp, Sheriff McKelvey, cowboy Johnny Ringo, Henry Schneider, foreman of the Tombstone Mining Company, and a professional gambler known only as Johnny Behind the Deuce. I'm staying in the pot. I'll see you, Johnny Behind the Deuce. All right, Mr. Schneider. How about you, Earp? On cards? Nope. I'm dropping out. Got nothing left to bet with. Well, you could risk your horse. Well, couldn't you, Virgil? Dick Naylor? No, sir. That horse is a thoroughbred. Besides, he belongs to Wyatt. Card? Ringo? No, I'm out. McKelvey? Reckon not, Johnny. I'll leave it to you and Snyder. All right. I'll take two cards. Just a minute, Johnny, behind the deuce. What is it, Snyder? Deal him off the top of the deck. You're accusing me of cheating? I saw what you did, you... Now, wait a minute, gentlemen. We won't have no fun. Uh, well, come on. You saw him, Earp. You saw him try to draw his knife. Fool, you killed Henry Snyder. That's murder. It was self-defense. Now, the mind is worship, Snyder. You'll be wild. Hey, Johnny, Johnny kill Henry Snyder. Snyder. You better arrest Johnny right away, McKelvey, and get him out of here. Oh, no, you don't. That kid horn needs lynching. Boy, you saw what happened here. It was self-defense, I tell you. Ah, it was murder, you little skunk, and you're going to get what's coming to you. How about it, boys? Come on! Well, they're getting out of hand, Virgil. I can arrest Johnny behind the deuce, but this mob will take him away from me and string him up sure. My horse can carry double and outrun these cow ponies. I got a scheme. You're not going to let him lynch me, are you, Virgil? Well, if I can get you to wires, keep your hand on your gun, Mac. Johnny, get between us and walk toward the side door. Don't let him take me, Virgil. Come on, easy now, so they don't suspect. Wait a minute now. You'll... Get out of the way, Ringo. You can't take this murder away from us, Virgil. Come Bye, on, Mac, run, run for it. Run, Get Johnny, run. run. McKelvey's got away that murder and hell. Come on. Come on, Ringo. It was a close race, but the gallant thoroughbred won. Only a few minutes ahead of a mob, which had increased to 500... Virgil Earp and his prisoner arrived at the Wells Fargo office in Tombstone and quickly explained the situation to Wyatt Earp and his brothers. So I know McKelvey couldn't hold him against that mob. Yeah. I'm turning him over to you as your prisoner, Wyatt. They stopped and got guns from the mine arsenal. They'll get me sure. They'll lynch me. Nobody ever took a prisoner away from the Earps and lynched him yet. You'll get a fair trial. Here's your shotgun, Wyatt. Good. Virgil, Morgan, take Johnny behind the deuce across the street into Vogan's bowling alley. Good. That's easy to defend being long and narrow. Yeah. That's right. With solid dopey walls high on both sides. Well, take him in and make your stand by the back door. If they try to storm you from the rear, you can pick them off faster than they can come in. That bunch of miners and cow waddies coming sure act like they mean business. Yeah, I expect they do, Jim. Well, come on, let's all get inside the building. Nope. I'm going to meet this lynch mob right here in the middle of the street. Are you crazy, Wyatt? No, I can handle this. You're just committing suicide, Wyatt. Jim, you stand there in the front door of Bogans and cover me. All right, boys, get going. Verge. If they get by me, give Johnny behind the deuce a gun. He'll have to look out for himself. Jim, stand there in the doorway. Come on, where's that white livered murderer? Come on, come on, come on. I'm hearing you, Dick Gird. We want the dirty little murderer that killed the foreman of my mind. Ah, ah, boys, boys, boys. Don't make any fool play here. That little tin horn ain't worth it. Get out of the way, Earp. We're going in. No, you're not, Gerd. He's my prisoner. We're going to get him. Come on, let's get that kill. Stop bluffing, Earp. You can't stop 500 men. Mr. Gerd, you're looking right into the muzzle of my shotgun. There's 18 buckshot in this gun, and the wads are split. If you want all of them, just take a step forward. Somebody back there. Shoot him. Oh, shoot me. But I'll take eight or ten of you with me when I go. You know I mean what I say. Look here, Herb. Get out of the way or we're coming. Oh, try it, Ringo. My finger's itching for you to draw. How about you, Bob Crane? You want to make a brave play and get killed? No? Drop your hand, then. Anybody else want to step forward and get killed sudden? Look here, Herb. That tin horn killed my foreman. He ought to be hung. He probably will be. But after a regular trial, all legal. Well... Well, don't be a fool, Dick. Well. All right, you fellas in the crowd there. 
Party's over. Go on home. I never thought I'd live to see the day when one man could buffalo a crowd of 500 miners and cowboys. Thus, Wyatt Earp, with true pioneer courage, helped establish law and order on the frontier and gave to us a heritage of peace and security. You get more Antonoc mileage with 76 gasoline, and that means smoother, more economical motoring. Because of its high Antonoc quality, 76 protects your motor. Because of its long mileage, it protects your purse. Next time you need gasoline, fill up with 76. More than 7,000 service stations in the West have this Union Oil Company product for you. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we have as our guest a man who is recognized as one of the originators of swing music. Before we bring him to the microphone, we are going to turn the clock back 20 years to a Denver apartment house. It is early afternoon. His wife is in the kitchen preparing dinner while he, well, he is at the piano. Hello? Oh, yes, Mrs. Jones. I know Mrs. Jones. Oh, I will, Mrs. Jones. Yes, Mrs. Jones. Benny! Benny! Yes? Oh, yes, Mrs. Reed. I know, Mrs. Reed. I, I will, Mrs. Reed. Yes, Mrs. Reed. Benny! 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 Uh, yes, Harriet? Didn't you hear the phone? Oh, no, dear, I didn't. It rang twice. Oh, yes? Yes. The first time it was Mrs. Jones. Oh. The Mrs. Jones upstairs threatening to take singing lessons if you didn't stop playing that piano. Oh, that'd be terrible. The second call was more important. It was Mrs. Reed. Uh, Mrs. Reed? Yes. Mrs. Reed is our landlady, you know. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. And she said if you touch that piano again today, we could move out bag yeah, and but, but gosh, Harriet, how can I practice? It takes practice and lots of it to do what I'm trying to do. I know, Benny, How but... can I make myself the greatest jazz pianist if I don't practice? Well, I haven't been doing it long today. Uh... And it's four o'clock. Except for half an hour for lunch, you haven't left that piano since nine o'clock this morning. Oh, Anyway, if Mrs. Reed throws us out, you can't sit on the sidewalk and practice. Oh, no, no. So you'd better forget it for today. Well, if she feels that way, I suppose so. Well, what'll I do for the rest of the day? Oh, say, I know. What? I'll take that song I've been working on. You know the one Norton wrote the lyrics for? Mm-hmm. I'll take it downtown and try to sell it. <laughs> There's one place I haven't tried. Hello, Benny. Come on in. Come on in. Well, what's on your mind? I, uh, I got a new song. I uh, thought you might like uh, First Crack at Bike. <laughs> <laughs> first Crack, huh? Uh, yes. What's the matter, Benny? Nobody else want it? Well, I, I really haven't tried to really sell it, you know. No, no, no. You really haven't tried oh. to really sell it, I know. <laughs> All right, come on. Let's have a look at it. What's it called? Oh, I uh, I haven't thought of a good title yet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Not bad. Well, I have and, but to... not too good. Not too good. Uh, not too good. Uh, can you use it? Well, I don't know. Depends on how much you want. I uh, I might use it for some of that ten cent stuff. You know, I sell quite a bit of ten cent music. Fifty or sixty copies a week. Oh, uh, ten cent. Huh? Yeah, ten cent. Uh, I'll tell you what. Yes. I'll give you. Uh, $20 for it. Uh, it's a deal. And my picture on the cover? Oh, no, no, no picture. 20 bucks cash. Remember, I got to think up the title. Uh, no picture? Uh, no picture. Oh. So the Denver Music Publishing Company published the song under the title Melancholy Baby. And in a period of about two years... Some 200 copies were sold. The years passed. The song was almost forgotten until one day, 14 years after it was written, Paul Whiteman played a symphonic arrangement of it. It swept over the country. Dance bands everywhere played it. You're hearing it now, played by the man who wrote it, 
Benny Light at the piano. Say just a word to our audience, Benny. Well, I haven't got very much to say, but it surely has been a thrill to be on Thrills. I thank you. Thank you, Benny Light. <laughs> David Brookman and the orchestra present our special guest tonight, star of Paul Whiteman's Music Hall the original first lady of the Saturday Night Swing Club, Miss Lee Wiley. Someday he'll come along, the man I love, and he'll be big and strong, the man I love. And when he comes my way, I'll do my best. me and smile I'll understand and in a little while he'll hold my hand and though it seems absurd I'm waiting for the man I love maybe I shall meet him Sunday maybe Monday maybe not Still, I'm sure to meet him one day, maybe Tuesday, will be my good news day. He'll build a little home, just meant for two, from which I'll never roam. Who would, would you, and so all else above, I'm waiting for.
from which I'll never roam. Who would but you? And so all else above, I'm waiting for. In our lifetime, the theater was graced by one preeminent as the greatest actress of all time. And yet there was a day when she was scorned by the same public that learned afterward to worship her. The greatness of Sarah Bernhardt was not recognized until one night when she was to play the leading role in Alexandra Dumas' play, Keen. It was a terrible night, a thunderstorm outside, a storm bursting forth inside as the most unpopular author in Paris, the famed Dumas, entered the box. Dumas, hated as a libertine, a literary charlatan, smiles scornfully at the audience. But in her dressing room sits Sarah Bernhardt listening to the stomping. Why do they do that, Berto? Dumas has entered his box, Sarah. He is well hated. I have seen them come up to him on the street. But if they shot at him... Will they not shut down his play? It is his play we are doing. Oh, let us hope not, Sarah. Oh, they will. They will. I know they will. Oh, why must my great chance be ruined? I have dreamed of this day when I should play my first leading role. And now, to look at my hands tremble. I, I am afraid. Oh, Sarah, all actresses are nervous on opening night. You have, have played his plays before. Oh, but yes. What happened? Paris audiences are cruel. Often we rang down the curtain. Oh, I can't go on. I can't. Oh, dear heaven, I am frightened. Look. Look at me, tremble. You are an actress, Sarah. You will go on. You be sure you will go on, Sarah. Alexandra. Berton, leave me alone with Mademoiselle Bernard. Of course, Monsieur Dumont. Oh, Alexandra, thank heaven you are here. I am frightened. I may be terrible. I, I am paralyzed with fear. My lines. My lines, I have forgotten them. I do not even know my first speech. Oh, Alexandra, why did you have to write this play? Oh, I hate you. So does the audience. Listen, my child. Tonight you win Paris or lose her. Tonight you prove yourself as great as I think you are, or as bad as they expect you to be. But more than that, tonight you may also save me from their hatred. You may save my play from their hisses. Now remember, when you walk across that stage... You are a great actress. Do you think I... I am a great actress? Yes, my child. Give Sarah Bernard the right to be famous. Mademoiselle Bernard, it is your cue. You're leaving Berton on the stage. Waiting, hurry, please. Sarah Bernard goes to the wings, stands for a moment, draws a deep breath, and trembling with fright, steps on the stage. Alone, she faces a house of shouting people. Then begins the battle of one voice against a thousand. Paul. Paul, it is I, Anna Danby. Come back to you. There is no hatred in my heart for you. Only pity. Oh, please believe me. Oh, Paul, I... I have no pride now. I am not one either to forgive. Oh, big forgiveness. I am a woman, begging for the chance to live or die by your answer to my plea. You are my lover, my husband, my world. The curtain of the first act falls in silence, without applause, without hisses, with only a silence that sends her rushing to her dressing room, where Alexander Dumas stands waiting. So, in one gesture, you ruin yourself and me. Oh, you see, Alexander, first it was hatred and noise, now nothing. Not one in all that audience to applaud. Oh, I have my verdict. I am a failure. 
I will not finish the play. I will never, never go on this stage again. I am not an actress. I have no business on this stage. Because there was no applause. Then I say that it is not art you seek, but something that shall feed your vanity. You are finished, Sarah. I thought you had genius. Now, I know you have no courage. Courage? What has courage to do with it? You are a coward. You are not fit for the theater. I am not a coward. You think just because you made them stout, stop shouting that you are brave. That is nothing. You have two more acts to make them love, worship, adore you, enshrine you in immortality. Make your name famous. Two more acts. That is all. But you are going to quit. Oh, you coward. Coward? I am not a coward. I have courage. I have. Well, you get out. I have a costume to put on. I show you how much of an actress I am if courage is all I need. Get out! Get out! Is she going on, Monsieur Dumas? You can. I feel like a god. I am a god. I have created an immortal being. She is an actress. When the last curtain fell, Sarah Bernhardt had earned her right to immortality. The applause that rang forth then continued on and on through the years, never to stop, never to fade, a tribute to the greatness of the divine Sarah. motorists want to get rid of carbon knocks because they don't like the noise. Actually, the noise is the least reason for removing them. What really matters most are the loss of power, the wasted gasoline, and the extra strain on the motor produced by carbon knocks. Triton motor oil cleans out carbon as you drive, changes ping to purr, usually within 3,000 miles. And when knocks are gone, you get more horsepower, extra gasoline mileage, a more enjoyable car to drive. These benefits of Triton motor oil were proved in a recent research test by more than 1,000 car owners. Triton gives these benefits because it is propane solvent refined, 100% pure paraffin base, 100% pure lubricant. Next time, try Triton, the motor oil that changes ping to purr. It's a product of Union Oil Company. Next week, at the same time, the Union Oil Company will again bring you thrills. Your narrator has been Gane Whitman. The orchestra was under the direction of David Brooklyn. This is Carlton Cadell wishing you good night on behalf of Union Oil Company. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Company.